Believe it or not, there were reports at the time where players were getting banned just for picking this champion. The simple act of just wanting to play your favorite champ in your favorite game, she was so underpowered, so bad, and everyone else assumed that you were trolling to the point that playing it would get you banned from League of Legends. Today's video is sponsored by Opera GX, and when it comes to sponsors, this is a fantastic brand to get involved with since I already use the browser on the daily. Opera is great because of the personalization. One of the most powerful features is the GX profile, allowing you to tailor your experience to your own personal needs. If you're a streamer, you can check the streaming preset, which automatically hides your personal information. If you've been looking at some things that you shouldn't have recently, yes, I'm talking to you, you can try out the rogue setting and clear your data. If your PC fan sounds like it's about to explode, try the potato setting and speed up your performance. Speaking of customization, how about all the cool colors and themes that you can choose from and personalize all your looks? You can set these awesome animated wallpapers, and if you want to force dark mode on pages to remove the eye melting light mode, you can do that too. Stay up to date with helpful and interesting news in the gaming world with the GX Corner. Here you'll find the best free games, deals, upcoming releases, and more. This browser has been designed to be as user-friendly and catered towards gamers as possible, and it's free to download and start using right now. Where are you going to find a better deal than that? So use my link in the description down below and start using Opera today. Thank you to Opera for sponsoring this video. What do these numbers represent? Those of you who like to look at data websites might instantly recognize it. These are the current pick rates for the most popular champions in the game. Kai'Sa, who is popular for reasons, has more than a 25% pick rate, meaning that she's seen in a quarter of all games right now. That is a lot. It's pretty crazy when you put it like that. If some champions are popular, by rule, other champions will have to be unpopular. We know that this massive roster of champions are not all picked equally, and it's understandable what makes certain champions more interesting than others. Players may want to fulfill their dream of becoming a samurai wind swordsman, dueling their brother to the death in an epic anime battle. And equally as so, some players just want to be a KDA baddie, which, I mean, hey, you do you. But in the case of these champions, they're currently struggling to see play, and you most likely understand why. I don't think any of these champions having a low pick rate surprises you, so that doesn't really make for an interesting and intriguing video. What if, however, we didn't look at right now? What if we looked back at League's original, unpopular, and off-meta picks? Most of these champions were so pathetically bad, underplayed, thematically uninteresting, clunky, and impossible to balance that they were eventually fully reworked and reimagined. Many of those reworks were fantastic and helped revive a formerly dead champion. But what about their original versions all those years ago? I had planned for this video to talk about over 20 champions, and it was going to be almost an hour long. Instead, I've decided to approach this in parts, so if I didn't mention one of them and you'd like me to talk about it in the next video, feel free to let me know in the comments down below. As mentioned in the beginning, a lot of champions you will see today were fully reworked, called a full VGU, Visual Gameplay Update. Riot does this with the intention to reimagine the champion. Not just new abilities, but a new theme entirely, with an updated splash art, icons, voice lines, animations, and typically a new identity. With that being the case, I figure there's no better place to start than right here. This was the first ever full rework of a champion, all the way back in 2013. It's possible that a sizable amount of you watching this video have never seen this champion before. It's been a long time now, and unless you're a League veteran, there really wouldn't have been a good way for you to have come across this. But yes, this was Karma, her original version. She existed in this state for a little over two years, from early 2011 to early 2013, and as you can probably guess, wasn't very good. The design didn't feel up to the standard of other champions, even for her time. Despite being a long time ago, Riot was still able to release cool and interesting champions. For example, Kha'Zix came out in 2012, and he's retained nearly the exact same kit, same splash art, animations, and theme. He's held up pretty well. Karma's original kit was both very different and also somewhat similar at the same time. The overall concept of her was always there, 
She didn't have a traditional ultimate, and instead used Mantra. Her E was still a shield, W was still a tether, and the Q was a damaging and poke tool, but in terms of all of the specific details, that's what was different. The Q would throw out these weird fans or blades or whatever these are in a cone, and immediately I see some problems. What is this animation? Doesn't it seem a bit odd? It isn't exactly great in terms of visual clarity. If you would use Mantra Q, it could also heal yourself and allies in this cone, which is kind of cool that she had some ally healing. Her W is the biggest change, and it's extremely unique. We've seen nothing like it since this version of Karma, but maybe for a good reason. Her W would attach a binding to enemies, allies, minions, wards, a bunch of different stuff. That tether would increase the movement speed of allies, decrease the movement speed of enemies, and any enemies, including minions that would pass through it, would take damage. This ability was clunky and awkward to use, and although I'm sure that some of you loved it and remember it fondly, it's unlikely we'll see something like this return. Attaching a tether to a minion and moving back and forth for wave clear feels weird. Is it fair to say something as harsh as like, this is too much work? I don't know. It doesn't it just seem like more of a hassle than anything else? It's pretty interesting that you could attach to allies and they could run behind enemies so that it does damage, but relying on teammates in League of Legends? Come on, that's a bit of a stretch. If you want more proof that this concept has not really worked out in this game very well, just look at Rel. Rel consistently dominates the win rate chart, has been played and used effectively in competitive play, and is clearly a strong champion, yet no one seems to play her. One potential reason for that is with her stun being the tether between her and her allies. No matter how many attempts at this type of ability we've seen, since the previous Mordekaiser version also had something like this for a while, it feels like the players don't like it. Maybe these abilities aren't fleshed out enough and that's the biggest reason, but clearly something is not clicking here. Her E did something pretty cool, it could damage enemies. It was pretty much the same shield that it is today, but instead of the Mantra E giving a big AoE shield for your team, instead, immediately upon casting it, it would explode for some damage. Finally, her passive was a bit boring, but appropriate for the time since passives weren't always 10 paragraphs. The lower health that she was, the more AP she gained. The theme felt bland with the dull grey colors and the dated splash art even for 2011 standards. She needed some help, so in 2013, Riot fully reworked her as the first VGU and it was a massive success. Other than a few tweaks here and there, and several nerfs because Karma has been a strong competitive champion, she's basically the same that she is today, which means they absolutely nailed it and deserve credit here. Her glow up is one of the best things they've done to this game. Now, I've done videos on some of the strongest champions of all time, but champion power in League history has to take into account the context. It's all relative, because in terms of absolute value of power, clearly Beta Twisted Fate and Beta Jax are the strongest ever. But are they really the strongest if they existed in the game at the same time competing with each other? The Beta, as a whole, had all of the power levels way off the charts. Annie had a 5 second stun during the Beta. What I'm really talking about here is true power. How strong was a champion compared to the rest of the field? So although Beta Twisted Fate is infamous for being insane, everything else was too at the time. That's why my big three for the strongest champions to ever exist are the 95% ban rate Kassadin from Season 4, released Kalista in 2015, and recently Zeri at her peak this year. But what about the low point for any champion in League history? Which champion was consistently bad for a long period of time? For close to a year, Evelyn might have been the most horrendous champion in game history. In a game where Talon in LeBlanc had a silence, Old Kale could one-shot you with two point-and-click buttons, and DFG Ari deleted you during the crowd control, this champion honestly did nothing well. She had very little damage, barely any utility or CC, she was squishy, no combat mobility, and other than her stealth, which didn't really help much in a meaningful way, she was useless. How did it get so bad for her? Well, back in 2011, Evelyn received one of the biggest nerfs in game history. She's always been controversial due to her stealth, and there's a somewhat hilarious strategy at the time where Evelyn would buy Sunfire Capes, which the damage would stack, and she could stand on people and just burn them from stealth. If you're wondering why this works, well, before the Assassin rework, which was many, many years after these clips, stealth used to be 100% effective even in close range. 
This build, for all of its hilarity and BS and funny clips, wasn't actually that meta, and her other builds were better, and she dominated solo queue for a seriously long time. All of this came together to highlight a big problem, which is that players hate playing against stealth. Nobody likes to buy pink wards, no one wanted to play around it, and it was a massive point of frustration. So after performing well in solo queue, she was gutted, with the most important change being the removal of her stun and changing it to a slow. Here's something to take away from this video, you can tell your friends this. At the time, there were reports of players being banned simply for playing Evelyn. Seriously. That's how bad she was. A combination of having a terrible score, probably being mass reported by their entire team, would cause players to get banned by the tribunal. Playing their favorite champion who was struggling with a 32% win rate could get you banned from playing the game. Poor Evelyn. Obviously, we eventually arrived at an Evelyn rework, which I think a lot of us would agree is one of the better ones. She has skill expression, she retained a lot of her original identity with the stealth, and the alt is very cool. Plus, again, you get to be a KDA pop star, and isn't that what it's all about? Champion design philosophy has evolved substantially over the years. Counterpick champions and situational champions are not the norm. Over the last couple of years, Vex is probably the best example of Riot trying to make a champion who can be used as a counterpick. Because of her passive, Vex is good into champions with mobility. However, it's not her entire identity. It's not as if Vex is unplayable into compositions with little to no mobility, because at the end of the day, she's still a strong mage with the ability to farm resources because she has solid wave clear. Typically, new champion design is attempting to create ones who are all around. They can usually do a little bit of everything, and their viability isn't contingent on what the enemy picked. The design philosophy that we have now is what other gaming communities would call all-rounders, like in fighting games. All-rounders can play many different styles in a variety of situations. Rather than being a dominating counterpick or excelling at one style, these types of characters are generally solid at most things. But going all the way back to the beginning of League of Legends history, 2009, 2010, and 2011, counterpicks were a much bigger deal than they are now. There's a reason that Ramus and Malphite dominate into heavy AD comps. They are the anti-physical damage armor stackers. And unsurprisingly, they're also two of the oldest champs in the game. These champions come from a different time, an era where Kassadin would steal your mana and was a true anti-mage. Vagar's ultimate scaled with your AP, and a few years back, Zed's ultimate for a time would give him extra AD based on the targets he killed. Jin mains would tremble in fear if Zed was picked. But would you believe me if I told you I still haven't listed the strongest counterpick of all time? Galio. One of the most underplayed, underappreciated, and weakest champions of all time, Galio also had the capability of becoming a god if he was picked into heavy AP comps and just got rolling a little bit. Galio's old passive increased his AP based on magic resistance. He could also amplify this amount with his W. It was a buff that he could put on himself or allies, increasing their resistances by a lot, and if they took damage during it, it would heal Galio. So he was very tanky while also dealing good damage. If you apply W to yourself, you'll get MR, which means because of your passive you'll get more AP, or you could throw it on an ally as they dive in and it would start healing him. He also had top tier wave clear with his Q and his E, and his ultimate is a supercharged version of his current rework W. It was an instant AoE taunt, and then would explode for big damage at the end, that amount was increased based on how much he taunted. So the big play for Galio was to look for multi-person flash ultimates, and it was a total game changer. I know your question now must be, why was he unpopular then? He seems really good, this kit seems strong. And you would be right, he did not have a bad kit. More precisely, it was unhealthy and hard to balance. The combination of a strong passive, very good basic abilities, and one of the better ultimates in the game made him an unstoppable terror against a couple of AP champions. He would dominate in the correct situation, which is why they kept him purposefully neutered. How did they keep him so weak? Mana costs. His mana costs were an absolute crime. It's true that he had good wave clear, but with a very big asterisk. You need items and blue buff. They kept him underpowered for several years until he was eventually reworked and we got New Galio. New Galio is a great champion, and while he's still underutilized, I feel that has more to do with his innate supportive style and theme. Not that many people want to play as this type of champion, when instead you could be a 1v9 superstar Zed main with serious main character syndrome. 
Surprisingly, I have never covered Xerath before on my channel. This Xerath that we have today is not his original version. Even though it feels like he's basically been the same forever, for about two and a half years he was pretty different. His Q was practically the same, and his ultimate was almost the same too, except he did not gain extra charges with each point. That was a buff that he got later down the line in 2016, and also his ultimate was much shorter range, but we'll come back to that. His passive was not a mana passive at all. Instead, he gained bonus armor based on his AP. Just as I was saying with Galio, Riot used to do this a lot with passives. They wanted to make champions that were used as counterpicks, and he needed this too since his abilities were shorter range than they are now. However, this is the fun part. His W was completely different. Locus of Power was very unique. Pressing it would immobilize himself for 8 seconds, giving his spells more magic penetration and 400 range. He could cancel it early if he needed to, and once it was done, he gained some movement speed. Maybe it's just me, but this is genuinely such a cool ability. It's similar to how Jin Ultimate immobilizes himself and then he can cancel it, but of course this spell is tricky to use properly, since it's a big trade-off of losing all mobility but gaining a massive amount of damage and range. I feel as though if this ability were in the game today, we would see players use it much better. Maybe it was just too ahead of its time for 2011, and I'd like to see Riot maybe try again with this concept on some kind of other poke mage. It fits the theme of artillery very well, since essentially you become a tower. After saying how much I liked his old W, I'll say his previous E wasn't all that interesting, and I like the way the stun ball is today. His E back then was called Mage Chains, it was a point and click damaging mark onto an enemy champion, and after being marked, if Xerath hit them with any of his other spells, it would consume the mark and stun them. In a lot of ways this is similar to how Bran stuns enemies, but it works better on Bran because he's shorter range and has a lot more burst. Bran is not really an artillery mage, so for Xerath this makes less sense for him to have a 2 button CC. You have to walk up to someone and press E on them, and then hit them with something else. And because your W isn't a damaging spell at all, unless you're ready to use your ultimate, it's not interesting since the only combo you do consistently is E into Q. He was pretty unpopular, and this playstyle felt undefined. Was he a battle mage or artillery? It almost seemed like he was trying to do both, but didn't excel at either of them. He was just okay at best. At the beginning of 2014, Xerath saw a big gameplay update which turned him into essentially what he is today. One key note about his ultimate that I did not mention before is just how much more range it has now. Even during the Locus of Power buff where his abilities gained 400 range, his ultimate isn't even close to what it is now. It was only 1300. For reference, 1300 range is a Caitlyn Q, whereas Xerath Ultimate today has a range of 5000, which while not global, is absolutely in the category of semi-global. They did well with him here, turning him from a battle mage and a mid-range mage into his proper long-range poke. When I think of League's bottom of the barrel champions from the old days, when I personally reminisce about which champions sucked back in the day, there's one that comes to mind first and foremost to me. Maybe it's because he was also ugly. I'm ugly and I'm proud. But when I started playing League, I remember what everyone told me at the time. The consensus was that Urgot is the worst champion in the game. The reason for him being the laughingstock had more to do with the duration of the suckitude rather than the magnitude of the trash if you catch my drift. Urgot never reached the lows of Evelyn, but he certainly stunk for the longest period of time, pretty much three full seasons of being terrible. As with nearly every champion on this list, it's because of him getting nerfed. A lot of times. He had an unhealthy kit that was impossible to balance and had little to no counterplay, meaning that Riot had no choice but to gut him to the ground. In League's early days, he was a dominant champion, with pros back in the very first season saying things like Urgot and Taric bot lane was unbeatable. Yeah, these two champions, an unbeatable duo. What a time. He was also viable in three roles, ADC, mid, and top, which meant that he was more difficult to balance than other members of this list as well. He was tough to 1v1 because of his innate tankiness, ranged poke, and he actually had some engage with one of the coolest ultimates in the game. The Urgot alt on a priority target was like a point and click insect, but the problem with giving this to a mid-range ADC caster and putting him in the middle of the team with no dashes meant that this was often a one-way ticket. Late game your damage completely fell off, which meant that your usefulness was in your ultimate, and you relied on your teammates to carry. 
everything about him was poorly designed, up to and including his theme. Thankfully for Urgot players, even if he's not 100% true to his original form, this version of Urgot that we have now is much healthier for the game, and I mean, look at him. He's cool as heck now, his new ultimate is amazing, and definitely some of their best work when in this rework. Lastly, a fun one. Which champion had the most broken kit ever? When I ask that, I don't mean strongest and not based on win rate, I mean on paper. Which kit is the strongest they've ever made? One that was so strong, buffing it would be a complete mistake. I think there's definitely a solid answer to that, and that's Poppy. Let's make this 100% clear. Old Poppy was not a bad champion, despite her horrendous numbers. She was ugly as all f I mean, look at her, but not a bad champion. Her kit was insane. It all starts with her passive. I want to make sure you truly understand what this did. When Poppy takes non-turret damage, so any champion damage, minion damage, or jungle damage, if it's going to deal more than 10% of her current health, she cuts it in half. That means that if Poppy has 1000 health, anything that will do more than 100 damage will do half damage. If Poppy gets low and has 100 HP, anything that does more than 10 damage will be cut in half. This is, without a doubt, one of the worst abilities ever designed. It made her deceptively tanky and almost impossible to judge how much damage she would take based on pure muscle memory and game knowledge, and it was very difficult to make that mental calculation. Her Q was also completely unfair. It was a basic attack enhancing reset like a Nasus Q, but it did percent max health damage and converted all of it to magic damage. So isn't it great when a champion can build full AD so you think that you should build armor for all of her damage and autos, and then she presses Q and crits you for 1000 magic damage instead. Love that. Poppy's W gave her a passive amount of bonus AD and armor stacking while in combat, but similar to how pressing Misfortune W instantly grants max stacks, this did too and also gave her movement speed. And her ultimate. Oh boy, her ultimate. The most infamous ultimate ability in the history of the game. Truly from another time. This is a beta level ultimate that just never got changed, and if by chance you've never seen this, you're in for a treat. Diplomatic Immunity. She could point and click on an enemy champion, causing them to take extra damage from the poppy, and then became completely immune to everything else in the game. So poppy could ult the support, and for 6-8 to eight seconds, only the support can deal any damage to her whatsoever, and only the support can CC her in any way. If she ulted somebody with no CC, then there was no way of stopping her, all with impossible to build against AD damage mixed in with converted magic damage crits. Watching and re-watching these old montages makes this look like the strongest, most powerful, most broken, unstoppable champion of all time. And that's exactly what she was. So what's the catch? How is it possible that she was bad? Well, the only thing that kept her remotely balanced is that she had the worst numbers of any champion in the game and had zero wave clear at all, making it difficult to get farm. She was made to be impossibly weak early game so that any champion could match up with her, and she was simply too bad to scale up consistently. The late game 6 item fantasy, in theory where she has no counterplay, was too difficult to get to. Riot directly told us during this time that if somehow, some way, players could find a strategy to help Poppy get out of the early game, it would be immediately nerfed. They knew that she was broken beyond repair, which is why similar to Yorick, she was removed from the free week rotation. Riot hid her away from the players, almost embarrassed that this champion even existed in their game. Playing Poppy all the way until 2015 was like having a time machine. It could show you a champion designed for a different game, long before League of Legends became the global sensation that it did. Almost unbelievably, this version of Poppy, and a much more well thought out and interesting champion like Echo or Kindred, existed in the game at the same time. 